Uh, Chris Marone heads the Community Development Working Group for OpenSFS, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to him. Hello again. So you've heard a little about the Community Development Working Group today, and I'm going to try not to repeat too many things you've heard. If I come up short, I'm sure no one will complain. Um, so our basic goal of our working group is to facilitate the community development of the Luster software tree. Um, we've got a lot of people involved, as you've seen in previous talks. There are a lot of different organizations. We all need to coordinate our strategies so we can maintain one source tree and one canonical branch that works for all of us. And to do that, to facilitate the developers, there's a lot of inf internet infrastructure we need to build up that we need to create and we all need to share to work together. And a lot of times you'll hear complaints from people oh, my patch is sitting in the review system and people are ignoring it. Well, we provide the forum that you can come to and tell us when that's happening and we're there to mediate and get everyone working on the same page. Now, the more astute among you have noticed that I'm not Pam Hamilton. Uh, Pam Hamilton ran the CDWG valiantly for two years. Um, I've got great respect for Pam. She's great at managing people. I've learned a lot from her. She's my boss at Livermore, so she'll still have some involvement in uh, Luster going forward. But she's stepped down to focus on other work at the lab. So Luster software development. If you've read anything about software development, you've probably seen a triangle like this or some other graph very similar. You always have the problem of balancing different requirements when you're doing software development. You've got the scope that you have to balance with the amount of time you have, with the resources you have, the money and the manpower. If these things aren't in balance, you're not going to have a quality software release. And balancing these different, often conflicting requirements, even within a single organization, can be extremely difficult. Just look at the number of failed software projects out there, and that's testament to this fact. We have the bigger problem that we're an open source project, and we have many different companies with different goals and timelines, and we have to coordinate all of those aspects. So I think it's very important that we have an open community like this, where we can all gather and exchange information and keep ourselves on the same page and coordinate our development efforts. Otherwise, development new features come out of nowhere, you don't know that they're landing, suddenly all the work you've done is thrown out the window, you've got to start from scratch because all the APIs changed and you've got to start over again. We'd like to avoid that as much as possible and be able to coordinate our efforts and work together. So one of the things we've decided with Intel and together with everyone else in the community is that we've going to put out, follow this train model. We're going to put out a major release of Luster every six months. And this gives you a rough idea of what we do. It's that every release is followed by a period of about three months when you can land major new features. And then you have another three months where that feature window is closed and we should be hardening and all working on testing and really getting Luster stable by the next release. If we allow that window to slip and we keep letting features in past that three month date, the amount of time we have to test and harden gets slower and the more likely that we're going to slip the release date of a release. Uh, so I think that's a problem if you go back to tri the triangle of scope. We need to maintain and keep the scope within an amount that we can get landed within that period of time. Otherwise, there's a domino effect. It pushes the whole schedule out in time. So obvious advantage, if everyone knows what's going in when, we know when the release dates are going to be, we can all work together much better. We can plan new products based on releases that we expect to have certain features in. And by having a strict time rather than always going, oh, we'll just put the release out whenever we think it's ready, you avoid feature creep. So what we decided to do to counter that problem, to both satisfy the train model we want to do and to satisfy users who have the real requirement of running a stable release for years at a time, is that we create maintenance branches every 18 months. One of the major releases along the main master branch of development that we put out will become the start of a maintenance branch. 
The maintenance branches on the picture here are vertical. Every one of those releases has only bug fixes or minor support for, say, a new kernel that's come out, a new major OS release. Any new features go onto the horizontal branch, the main branch of development. So you've already seen most of this in previous talks, so I'll go over it quickly. But I think it's important to point out again that following this train model, we have put out two releases in 2012, and things seem to be going pretty well. Pretty soon, Luster 2.4 is going to come out, and that's going to be both a feature release along the master branch, but it's also going to be the start of a new maintenance branch. Uh, many of us will probably be running it for at least 18 months, if not three to five years, much like people did with 1.8, and much like we're doing with 2.1, we keep having uh, maintenance releases for Luster 2.1, nominally every three months. Um, it's also always possible if we find a major bug early on in a maintenance branch, we could do it uh, tag more soon. Um, and you've already seen much of this today, but it's worth pointing out again that there are a lot of organizations all contributing to code, and the effort that goes into reviewing all of those patches and keeping a single branch of Luster up to date is uh, quite extensive. It's, it's a, definitely not a zero cost effort to manage a branch like that. So Luster 2.5 is going to come out next, and very soon we now we're already planning the releases, what features are going to be in that release. Next week in the CDWG call, we're going to be talking about this. So I encourage all of you to come out, join us on the call. Um, tell us what you want in the release so we can uh, get it planned. If you have a development effort that is underway, tell us about it. Help us get it on the wiki, our table of the development features in progress, and we'll help track that with you and see whether we think it's going to land in the next 2.5 release or whether it has to go on release after that. Uh, so people frequently ask the question, what about 1.8? Uh, what's the OpenSVS position on 1.8? Now originally, Sun Oracle had planned to end of life 1.8 in June 2012. So we're beyond that. People are still running it and still like that version and have people have various concerns about the the client code in Luster 2.1. Some of them are warranted. Um, our position is there's just too many versions of Luster to work on for us to put a lot of open SFS and community effort into the 1.8 branch. But there are vendors out there that are perfectly happy to continue supporting you. So talk to your support vendor. And if you're happy with 1.8 and want to stay there for a while, I'm sure your vendor would like to make an arrangement with you. Uh, one of the things we do in CDWG is update the high-level Luster Community Roadmap slide to keep everyone, um, all of our users, our companies on the same page for what the major new features are in upcoming Luster versions. And one of the ways that we support the development of the master branch, all of the effort that goes into supporting, doing all the code reviews for all the changes that come in, is that we have a community tree development contract with Intel. Um, remember I showed you this picture before. This contract governs the master branch, not the uh, maintenance branches going vertically. So we partially fund the care, testing, and development of this master branch. So. If you're familiar with software development, you know that reading someone else's code is usually harder than writing code yourself. It takes a lot of time and effort to go through, verify, and iterate on a patch with someone to get it into proper state to be ready for landing in the branch for everyone to use. So we help keep that process going by funding about half of it. Um, this contract we designed not to have a set end date, it's month to month, it's ongoing at agreement of both OpenSFS uh, open and Intel. Um, currently, people are discussing some changes we'd like to make to the contract, so we're planning to amend it sometime soon. If you have something you'd like to see changed, please come send a message to CDWG or call into our calls, and we're going to collect uh, requirements there for making adjustments. 
Uh, another thing we do to find out what people um, want from Luster and how they're using Luster is that we put out the Luster Community Survey. Um, thanks to Peter Jones for, for doing that this year. Uh, here's some high-level information from the survey. Um, last year, 90 people completed the survey. This year, 73. Uh, I summarized 109. So you'll notice the numbers don't add up. That's because some people do use multiple versions of Luster, and they're allowed to tag multiple versions when they answered the survey. Uh, so there are 109 uses of 100 of 1.8 in 2012, and 20 and 28 uses of 2.0 or newer. In 2013, you can see it's much more even. Uh, the uses of 1.8 is clearly dropping, and 2.0 and newer is uh, certainly taking off. Uh, here's in more detail a graph of the usage of various versions. You can see in 2012, 1.8 and was by far the most dominant version in use, not very much 2.1 usage. But in 2013, Recent WAM Cloud 1.8 releases and the 2.1 releases are the most common in use. And we're starting to see some usage of 2.3 taking off too. Uh, an interesting fact for users is that only about a third of all of our respondents have formal support contracts. Other people either have support from the community, mailing lists, that sort of thing. Uh, interesting, very few people said that we just have no luster issues at all, but there were a couple. Uh, another thing we do to support development is work on the web infrastructure of OpenSFS. So the OpenSFS board tasks us to redo, revamp, and have a much more modern website for OpenSFS. And this is the result of that. Uh, Pam Hamilton and I were involved in doing that. We contracted with a company named Loud Dog to uh, create the website for us. Um, this is all WordPress based, uh, so it's pretty modern infrastructure that most of us will probably not have much difficulty keeping up to date. As a part of this effort, we also created a new Luster portal. It's at luster.openSFS.org. And we feel that this web portal, which recently we've been working on, started about a few months ago, um, we think that this is the most up-to-date, most modern version of a Luster web portal that is out there right now. Uh, we need more content. We encourage you to join us to add more content to the website. But if you want to find the latest versions, the latest uh, documentation, this is the place to go right now. We also created a new wiki for OpenSFS. Um, we see the Luster portal as being kind of the high-level interface where you first learn about Luster and get direction and link off to more detailed information in the wiki. Uh, community Development Working Group, you can see the page there. I'm keeping all the meeting minutes from the CD, CDWG meetings on there. So if you wonder what we did and you missed the call, you can go to a website and find out my summary of what happened. But most importantly, we need you. We need more people volunteering, getting involved, telling us what you want from Luster, and helping us keep all of this information up to date. We can't stay on the same page if we're not all talking to each other. So we need your developers to join in on the calls, tell us what you're working on. We need you to help out, especially with testing. Testing is constantly a problem for us. Um, the, the space, the testing space that we have is impossibly large, and we can't possibly test everything on our own. Uh, I think that's a big problem with um, using home directories on Luster. What we test is not the kind of thing that home directory users do. Um, while we try to be POSIX compliant, um, POSIX compliant is kind of a very niggly thing. It's hard to figure out exactly what a lot of the POSIX um, semantics mean and how you can support them in a scalable, performant manner on a parallel distributed file system. And sometimes we miss things and you don't notice that typing LS takes five minutes sometimes. And <laughs> when you run subversion, you get this, it just subversion does this very weird thing in your home directory that nobody else does in the normal HPC world. 
So having people join in and actually run these, the, the releases before they come out, use it as a home directory. Tell us what happens when you run Subversion and whatever tools you use in your home directory. I mean, we've had problems where you run Emacs or VI and they just have to open and modify the file in a slightly different way that no one else has tried and just doesn't work quite as well. So even if you don't have $500,000, you can certainly contribute a lot to OpenSFS and to the Luster community in general um, by joining in. You can help us figure out when we should land various things, what the roadmap should look like to satisfy the broader needs of the community. And of course, you can help out with documentation. Um, you don't need to be a Luster developer to get in there and read the Luster manual, try things out. If it doesn't work, open a bug, tell us about it so we can fix it. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about CDWG, if you want to follow along with what we're doing, if you want to find out when our meetings are, um, here's some URLs for you. It should be easy to find. And once again, if you want to learn about Luster, we feel like this is the place to go, luster.opensfest.org. Um, a bunch of us are working on getting that up to date. And that's about all that I have. Anybody have any questions? Got one over here. So I was half asleep during Peter's talk, but when I asked the question about HSM, he said 2.5. Yes. You just showed a slide that said 2.4 is the maintenance release going forward. So we're not going forward with a release that has HSM in it. Has that been debated to the ground? Is that still open to discuss? I think it has been debated to some point, certainly. There are a lot of people who would really, really like to see that in there. Um, certainly core HSM. Um, is there. Most of the things we need in the server and the luster part are there and as I understand it mainly what's missing is more of the user space, the um, things to coordinate what luster does um, from the HSM um, side of things. Uh, I think at this point we're already pushing the limit of what we can do in 2.4. Really, it would have been nice to have all of this landed during the feature freeze section. I mean, this gets back to the train model. Um, our choices now are either to drop the feature and follow the train model or to delay our release. And the longer we delay the release, the more other people are going to go, oh, well, I also have this other version, this other little feature you can sneak in too because you're delaying it for that. Um, I'm not sure that entirely benefits the community to continually delay the release, but a lot of people feel strongly about HSM. Join us on the CDWG call and tell us how you feel about it. Um, what's your feeling about uh, the community's support for working on technical debt and stability issues rather than ever more features? Yeah, I feel strongly that OpenSFS should be focusing more on technical debt that the new features we have are forcing us to ignore some very long-standing bugs and issues in Luster that we continually don't address. Um, someone, of course, HSM has been mentioned, but in a broader sense, Luster is very difficult for sysadmin sysadmins to use. Uh, the, the basic user space command set is pretty, um, let's just say, antiquated. <laughs> but um, we could do a lot in that area, but we spend too much time focusing on things like um, D&E and other features, which we all want that as well. We, I mean, this gets back to a triangle. We have competing requirements a lot of time. For HPC, we constantly need to be pushing the envelope and uh, making Luster perform better. But we may have overstepped a bit and scoped a little too much into the last release. Um, you saw in, I think, Peter's slides, um, the number of lines that change in 2.4 was huge compared to some of the previous releases. and. That means that we're still scrambling right now to squash a lot of major bugs. And when we're scrambling to finish fixing all of those major bugs, it means that 
a hundred smaller bugs just get brushed under the rug. Um, and users will notice those. I know at Livermore, a lot of our users are going to notice a lot of those bugs that are not marked as blockers. So I think we need to I think we need to slow down on the feature development a bit so that we can focus on the technical debt so that every time we do another major feature, it doesn't require that we introduce a whole bunch of new bugs because nobody really understood the existing code because of all the existing technical debt. So Chris, I'm going to jump in there. Go ahead. Um, so one of the things, the question is about handling technical debt. That's one of the things that we're dealing with in the technical working group. So the split that we've worked out between the two groups is that the TWG is looking at new features as well as addressing the, the problems in the existing code, what, what we're calling technical debt. So bugs, there's a, ideas of dead code, some of the documentation. We're looking to have that addressed as part of the, the contract work that we're driving for. We'll, we'll report on this tomorrow during our part of the presentation. And what that leaves the CWG to, worry, to work on and focus on is that those, those pieces of code that are landing in the tree, making, you know, determining when those things are going to be in a release and trying to, to uh, manage the release process itself rather than worrying about contracting for features or contracting to get technical debt taken care of directly. Does that seem OK? Way to describe it, but we can push that off till tomorrow then. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's get a show of hands, like uh, who's involved and who thinks that they could contribute. Okay. Uh, there's a suggestion. I would like to see a show of hands of who's currently involved in the CDWG and OpenSFS on these releases. That's nice to see. Good. And. Who thinks that they can contribute in the future? Who's going to come and join us for the 2.5 um, uh, feature development, for instance? OK, OK. I'd like to see a few more hands. Um, I, I think it's really important to emphasize, again, that you don't have to be a member at the $500,000 level to contribute. I mean, Indiana University is a great example. They're not at the $500,000 level, but they've made a fantastic contribution to Open Asset Fest. They run our test servers. They're involved in development. They're on a lot of our calls contributing to our planning. So uh, you can contribute no matter what your skill level, whether you're a system in developer, doesn't matter. We can use you in some way. I mean, does this interest you guys at all? I mean, me, I'm psyched about this. This gives me an opportunity in my organization the chance to, to try to drive the bus and to shake <laughs> things and to get the things that we need. I don't know. I don't want to sound like a TV preacher. <laughs> but, you know. Yes, no, maybe? Yes. 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 All right, that's good. <laughs> Galen. Quick question. Um, you're, you're, doing, uh, you're talking about the luster.opensfs.org. So the luster.opensfs.org. You mentioned that you know you're trying to get we're trying to get more resources to to add uh, content to this and really flesh it out. One of the mm -hmm. things we touched on earlier as a as a goal is to increase the education and and uh, um, educating users on how to use Luster, how to configure Luster, how to make it. Um, very easy for them to, to get started. Um, is there something OpenSFS could be doing in, in concert with that portal to um, accomplish both goals? Um, certainly. Uh, I mean, one of the very earliest things is to update the Luster Manual. Um, a few years ago, we used to nickname it Livermore the Big Book of Lies. <laughs> it's gotten better. And uh, there's a lot of work on the Lester Manual right now to get it up to date and make sure that when it talks about how to use APIs and commands, that everything is accurate. Um, we link to that now through the new website, the very latest version of that. And there's a push now as 2.4 is coming out to get that updated. We'd love to have more people involved with that. Um, what other things are you thinking there? Uh, certainly documentation. I mean, is there, um, you know, are there you know, best practices that we can develop? These are things that it seems that, that a lot of people could get involved in helping develop. So we can even fund you know, some of those efforts, I think. Sure. So if you didn't hear uh, these thing, things like best practices, um, that'd be great if we uh, start. Um, the wiki is open to all, so we can coordinate on uh, setting up new pages with you know, 
best practices for how you should configure your luster system in different environments and different hardware. And uh, that'd be a great thing if people wanted to join in and add that. Um, you brought up a good one there, Ryan. What if, what if vendors were to provide best practices for setting up Luster on their particular hardware infrastructure, and that's something we could ask vendors to participate in? I, I think sure. it, would, it would benefit them and benefit OpenSFS and the user community. Sure, that'd be great. One of my pet projects for a while now has been the Luster build system, and I think that's another thing that we can work on in uh, OpenSFS CDWG. We can focus on trying to get Luster's build system and its packaging to a point where it's much easier to install than it is right now. Uh, the packaging has a lot of flaws. There's no yum repo you can easily point to. The main download site's just an FTP site basically with a set of RPMs. You still have to use RPM by hand and download all the correct packages. Um, that's something we should have had years ago. I think that's something we can push on and we can make a real contribution. And I feel like that's kind of your first introduction to Luster is getting it installed. And that should be easy. And we can make progress there, I think, in time for 2.5. Um, Chris, another question going back to the HSM that Brent raised. So we're on this path of having two, two release tree, or trains, the maintenance train on an 18-month schedule and the feature release on a six-month schedule. So since HSM is an example of something that, that missed the, the maintenance release, instead of holding up the 2.4, what are the options for landing some, you know, when a feature lands in 2.5, of backporting that to 2.4.1 or 2.4.2 or something like that. Has that been discussed in the group as to how to bring relevant features back into the maintenance release? That has been discussed and um, backporting features is a possibility. I feel like that seriously, now I'm just speaking for myself now, not for all of OpenSFS or everyone in OpenSFS. My feeling is that backporting features is violating the contract of a maintenance branch. A maintenance branch is supposed to be bug fixes so that you don't have the opportunity for more instability. Um, HSM may be a special case because it may be that we have enough of the core in that the new things we add on have no destabilizing effect on what's already in there, that it's all optional stuff that's added on the side um, so that that possibility has been discussed. That may happen. I don't know. Uh, just one comment from updating the wiki. If we had a, it would be it would get fairly advanced fairly fairly quickly. But I recently had to update the last ID file on one of the OSTs and wound up running through a procedure for. I think it was in one six that was addressed in one eight. Uh, I had to go screw around with a hex editor and a bunch of other things. And apparently now all you have to do is delete it, and it gets magically regenerated. But have that sort of information that right now you can only get from searching, you know, googling and searching on email, um, in some place that's at least coordinated would be a great piece of info. Would be a great resource too. I think everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. That'd be fantastic for people to contribute that information. Another thing that we frequently wonder is um, when you upgrade a file system, is it really going to be fully supported? For instance, we have systems that were formatted back at 1.8, maybe even 1.6, some of them. And later on, now we're running 2.1 code, and we wanted to use Robinhood from CEA. And we turned on the feature that enables FIDs, which is something that Robinhood requires, and only then learned that it doesn't really fully turn them on. It, you would actually have to have the entire tree from the root level created uh, with this new flag turned on. So having that kind of upgrade information available to people so they know what they're getting as they upgrade and what complications they might have, that, that, that would be great to better communicate to people. Um, I just wanted to point out um, about the maintenance branch discussion that OpenSFS isn't funding any maintenance branches. We're only partially funding the activities that are occurring on the master code line. 
And so whatever happens with a maintenance branch is not, really OpenSFS doesn't have any right, I guess you could call it, to, to dictate what would happen there because it's done by another vendor. Um, but perhaps that's something that OpenSFS wants to consider so that they, we feel like maybe we do have a say in it. Yeah, that's true. We don't have any, Intel doesn't have any financial obligation to us, but they're friendly and we work well with them. So I think if we <laughs> communicate with them, there's something very important that needs to be done there. I, they generally are pretty open to working with us. And some of us have support contracts with them anyway that help there. But you're right, that, that's something we should discuss in CDWG, whether we want to allocate more money to actually having a more vested interest in OpenSFS supporting the maintenance branches. So I, uh, I still see an unbroken rib on this horse, so I'll, I'll just ask the question anyways. <laughs> I mean, how do you feel about the, you know, a, 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 a model more like with Red Hat where, hey, CEA, you know, the code, the code lands in 2.5. I mean, I see this maybe as an opportunity for vendors to differentiate themselves. If Xyrotex or DDN wants to roll that into their own distribution and provide that feature, does that not, you know, how do we feel about that as a community? I mean, I see that as an opportunity for differentiation for them, but do we have problems within the group for that? Uh, that's a good question. I think we'd have to hear from more people on that. That might be okay. I know at Livermore we tend to do that. We have our own branch of Luster. Um, the way we operate is we try to keep our patch set against the upstream code fairly small. Less than 50 patches is nice. And we've been pretty successful recently. It's in the 20s a lot of the time. So we do sometimes backport features or bug fixes that we need before they've come out from future versions. Um, I can see vendors doing that and uh, doing their own testing to validate it for an older release that could be value add. Um, not sure how other people feel about it. It is somewhat what we have today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Andrea said that, that that's basically what Nathan said. They're, they're doing that. They, they have their own branch they're maintaining as well that they test for their customers and perhaps add features to and certainly many bug fixes. <laughs> I guess I would question you about that just from coming from so many years of being in the open fabrics community and you guys are, are dealing with a lot of the same things they're dealing with and and having all these different versions and stuff is can be detrimental and really has to be managed cautiously. Uh, yeah. Um. Possibly. We wouldn't want um, severely diverging versions, certainly. And it'd be nice to have people not introduce backporting that majorly changes APIs or things that are drastically affect users. There's probably space for some things to be added that are just a little earlier than, but will appear in a later release. So. But a lot of the open fabrics differences were driven by the vendor who was pushing out lots of features because their hardware was differentiated based on the features getting into open fabrics. So this is more, I think, getting to what Dave was saying, is that you're, the code is already out in the open. It's not being hidden from somebody, but it's allowing those vendors who have want to make the effort of backporting it onto their branch, making it work there. So it's, it's community release code. It's just where is it appearing in customer products. And I th Yeah, I was just saying uh, it's just a way of coordinating release schedules, so I don't see it as a problem. That's, this has always happened, right? I mean, yep. you, like Nathan was saying, you need to get a, a fix out to a support customer and, and have that versioned and roll it out to your customers because it's a bug that affects your hardware more than others. Fine, you know, as, and it will be there in the upstream release and you'll drop that patch just like we do, just like Red Hat do with the upstream uh, Linux kernel, right? Yep. So, so the reason I brought the, the point up was just to resolve, you had left it hanging about whether you're going to hold 2.4 to get HSM in. And I think that does break the maintenance or the, the 
train model that you're trying to implement. And so I'm saying that it doesn't mean that it's not going to be available to customers. There are ways of getting it done, whether it's done officially in the maintenance release or it's something that's available from vendors, I think that's a way to get it done. I mean, the thing, the thing with the HSM thing is let's, let's say it's ready to go in 2.5 or it's ready to go in 2.6. You know, it's finally, everything's there. Okay, but that's not a maintenance release. Okay, well, if Zyrotex or somebody else who provides luster support decides that, okay, HSM went into 2.6 and they're going to make that a maintenance release for their customers. So they'll drive one of the vertical spikes out of it. And anybody who's in a hurry to get onto HSM doesn't want to wait till the next official maintenance release can take that one and ride it for your three to five years. If there's enough people that want to jump on that horse six months before it would be available on maintenance release, then fine, the, the market's there so we can do it. And the other side of it is like you're saying, whether you like this flurry of different versions or not, hey, that's open source, guys. <laughs> it's not about like, it's about live. <laughs> okay, we're just about out of time. Anybody? Bueller? All right. All right, thanks, everybody.